Our theme for worship today is Jesus the Teacher. There's a beautiful verse from Philippians 2.15, Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Using that verse as our theme, we're going to join in a responsive prayer now, and I invite you to join in the response after each section of the prayer, as you see on the screen, that's based on the content of this verse. Let us remember Jesus, though he was rich, He became poor for our sakes and lived among us. He was content to be subject to his parents, the child of a poor couple's home. He lived a common life for 30 years, earning his living with his own hands and not declining any humble tasks. The people heard him gladly, for he understood their ways. May this mind be in us, which was in Christ Jesus. Let us remember Jesus. He was mighty indeed healing the sick and the disordered, using for others the powers he would not invoke for himself. He refused to force people's allegiance. He was master and lord to his disciples, but lived among them as their companion and as one who served. His desire was to do the will of God who sent him. May this mind be in us, which was in Christ Jesus. Let us remember Jesus. He loved people, yet went away from them to pray, rose a great while before dawn, watched through the night, stayed in the wilderness, went up a mountain, sought a garden. When a tempted disciple needed help, he prayed for them. He prayed for the forgiveness of those who rejected him and for the perfecting of those who received him. He observed the traditions, but defied convention that did not serve the purposes of God. He hated the sins of pride and selfishness, of cruelty and impurity. May this mind be in us, which was in Christ Jesus. Let us remember Jesus. He believed in people and never despaired of them. He never lost heart in the face of disappointment. He disregarded his own comfort and convenience and thought of others' needs first and was always kind, though he suffered much. When he was reviled, he uttered no harsh word in return, and when he suffered, did not threaten retaliation. He humbled himself and carried obedience to the point of death, even death on the cross, as a result of which God has highly exalted him. May this mind be in us, which was in Christ Jesus. Let us unite in prayer that Christ may dwell in our hearts. O Christ, our only Savior, dwell in us so deeply that we may go forth with the light of your hope in our eyes and with your faith and love in our hearts. Amen.
today and find the warmth not only of this beautiful sanctuary, but the warmth of fellowship and the warmth of his presence today. For those who are worshiping with us at home, we pray that you'll feel that warmth as well too and that the blessings we share this day will be yours as well. We hope you're not just a spectator. We hope you'll be a worshiper and feel free to respond with your comments and your um, words and your prayer requests as you do that. For those of you gathering here, this is our time also to have our connect cards as well. And we thank you for lifting those up as well as not just registering your attendance, but also to lift up your, your prayers and your praises um, to the Lord. In our prayers today, we especially want to keep in mind the Witt family um, over in Hampton Hills who suffered a loss with a house fire yesterday. And um, I know you'll want to be lifting them up. He's a, a pastor at the Garden City Bible Fellowship. He's a neighbor of Joyce, and so I've asked Joyce to kind of fill us in a little bit. I believe this was yesterday morning. And so if you'll please keep the Witt family in your prayers. Um, yesterday morning around 11.33, I, I saw it looked like fog, but then Gracie and the dog started barking, and I looked out the window, and there was a fire escape, a fire truck coming up. And so I rushed out. I had to pause my um, Bible uh, Zoom class that I was taking, and I rushed out, and uh, the house uh, flames were coming out of their living room. And Gary and Sandy were sitting on their back porch, and I grabbed quilts, blankets, coats, and I even bought coat, uh, socks. Sandy was barefooted and didn't have any coat on or anything, so I wrapped a quilt around her, put socks on her, and uh, put my coat on Gary. And they were holding each other, and she was crying. And she uh, told me, she says, "Joyce, I tried to save them. I tried to save them." They had two dogs, and she was trying to coax the dogs out, but they were so scared that they wouldn't come to her. And uh, she uh, had, uh, her face was a little red, and she had one burn mark on her cheek. Uh, paramedics said it was uh, uh, first degree burn. And so they were debating whether they were gonna go to the hospital. And I stayed with them, and then a lady came a young lady came down where I was with them, and she knelt down. She took her shoes off and gave them to Sandy to put on. And then we had prayer together. It was so beautiful. And uh, so I stayed with Sandy until they put her in the emergency room, uh, ambulance. Uh, but they all showed up later, and their pastor uh, came and uh, brought them. And the children finally came, so I got to greet them, hug them, and I told every one of them that we need to, I need to know what our church can do for you. So they promised that they would get back to me to let us know what they need. So just keep them in, their, in your prayers. And it's unlivable right now, so they're staying with family, but they're safe. Thank you for that update, Joyce, and thank you for being there and being God's angel in this, in this um, special time of need. Let's pause for a word of prayer. God, we do lift up the Witt family during this um, difficult um, journey, and Lord, we just pray that there will be blessings and signs of your presence, even amidst the pain and the heartache, and that God's people will rally together. And this is a time we remember we are all one in you. So bless our efforts and comfort them. Um, this family that's devoted themselves to comforting others. Now help them to receive your comfort and your sweet blessing in so many ways. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So if you showed up today thinking the preacher was going to be gone, that's because you read your newsletter, I guess. And then um, you may notice I'm still here. We, we are about to lead on vacation on Tuesday, but we rearranged our dates um, to switch from a cruise to a car trip. That seemed a little safer this time of year, and so um, that's what we'll be doing. So I will be away next Sunday, but only one Sunday away. Reverend Donna Hopkins Britt will be with us next Sunday. She preached for us several years ago, I believe. Um, she is a lot, was the longtime pastor of Calvary Baptist Church on Campbell Avenue. That was actually her home church growing up. She's now involved in hospice ministry. 
and maybe she'll have the opportunity to um, have some examples of some of the things she's doing, and she's going to come and bless us with the sermon next Sunday. So just because the preacher's away, don't let the mice play. Be sure and show up and, and help support Donna as she comes to bring you um, the word on this day. Today we do think about Jesus the teacher, and I want to share a scripture reading from Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 29. Jesus said, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike their teachers of religious law. We give thanks to God for the gift of his word. So we think today about Jesus the teacher, and I hope some of you had the opportunity to read the chapter from um, we make the road by walking. By the way, we're just going to skip a week, so you got two weeks if you're working on the, on the chapters before we get to um, next week's chapter. One of the things I found really fascinating was to that part of the chapter where um, McLaren talked about the different ways in which Jesus was a teacher, ways in which Jesus taught. One of those was through signs and wonders. Now, I don't think of that as teaching, but it was that when Jesus calmed the waves or when he walked on the water or when he fed the 5,000, he was teaching. And so when you stop and think about it, there have been so many great sermons about those particular actions, and those are still learning experiences for us as well. The people learned something about God through the things Jesus did. More common, of course, we think about what we would call public lectures. There's probably mo no greater example than what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Chapter 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew. And the scripture I just read, where it said the crowds were amazed because Jesus taught with authority, that's the end of the Sermon on the Mount. That's where we have the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are, they, are, are you when people persecute you. Um, the sayings like, um, seek first the kingdom of God, let your light shine. Those three chapters are just chock full. You could just spend a long, long time and never get out of the Sermon on the Mount. And, and we see how Jesus gathered the crowds together. McLaren also talks about the unplanned moments when something happens, unexpected. And we see how Jesus reacts. You stop and think about it, that's probably where you learned a lot from your parents and your grandparents and important people in your life. It wasn't necessarily when they sat down and said, okay, son, okay, daughter, I'm going to teach you a lesson today, but it's something that they never expected would happen. I have moments like that where I remember that some of my values, things that still direct me today are things that I saw my parents or my grandparents do in unplanned moments where I saw how they reacted. There was, there was a day my dad came home. I heard about this because I wasn't there at the time. He came home from church at, to eat lunch at noontime on, on one of the days during the week, and he didn't have a shirt on. And my mom was kind of like, what on earth? Why are you walking around without a shirt? And he said, well, somebody came by the office that needed a shirt. And so you know, I still remember those stories. Those are the lessons that you still learn, those unplanned moments. Another time I remember digging through my um, dad's desk at the parsonage, and there was a pack of cigarettes in there. And I thought, you never smoked. I said, Daddy, what are you doing with a pack of cigarettes in your desk? And he said, well, there was a guy several years ago that came to me and said, I'm giving up cigarettes, and I want you to hold on to this pack and always keep it so you'll remember to pray for me that I managed to stay off of cigarettes. And that's why he had a pack of cigarettes there in his desk. Unplanned moments. There's also the time with his disciples. We know Jesus taught a little differently with his closest disciples, sometimes the 12, sometimes the closest three, and he revealed to them things that the crowds weren't yet ready to hear. This was more relational. This was deeper. 
and we're so privileged to be able to have those conversations even yet today. Stop and think about all the things you wish that you had written down from your mom or dad. Maybe some things you're glad you didn't write down, but maybe there are some things you wish you had written down or wish you had them on video, but you didn't bother to do it. And then think about the fact, wow, how much of Jesus we have so many generations ago. It's like a treasure that we have these words of Jesus. McLaurin also talks about his public actions, things that he did that demonstrated teaching. I guess a perfect example would be when he turned over the tables in the temple. That seems quite out of character, but it was not a, not a fit of rage, but it was a teaching moment there to teach what God's kingdom was really all about. And then, of course, the parables. One of Jesus' most cherished forms of teaching Stories like this. There was a man going down the road from Jericho, and he was beaten by robbers and left for dead. And that particular story talks about what does it mean to be a neighbor. And those of us who've heard that story many, many years, when we hear the word be a neighbor, we think of that story. And that story sticks in our heart and teaches us even yet today. The story of a father's love that never gives up. So memorable because Jesus told a story about a man who had two sons. And one always did the right things, but one was sort of a rascal and just demanded his inheritance and left and went off and did stupid things. And if we'd never heard that story before, we would begin to think, okay, this is going to be a story of what goes around comes around, right? This young boy is going to get his... Um, lesson. He's going to learn his lesson well. This is going to be a morality tale, and we find out it's not that at all. It's a story of grace. It's a story of unbelievable love that the father welcomed home the rascal son who had done everything wrong, and it's a story that causes us to see everything different. I guess I would add one more to McLaurin's list of these six things, and that would be also the way Jesus treated people. Um, when, when, when people were shunned by others, Jesus had a place for them. When people were put down by others, Jesus welcomed them in. I think about Zacchaeus. I think about the woman caught in adultery. Uh, the way Jesus treated people who were on the edge, who other people overlooked, he welcomed them in. And he could not give a greater blueprint for his followers on how to live. Jumping back to that passage from the end of the Sermon on the Mount shows us how people reacted. Matthew 7, 28 and 29. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. For he taught with real authority, quite unlike their teachers of religious law. In other words, he didn't just deliver a talk. He didn't just explain somebody, else idea, uh, somebody else's ideas. His words, I would put it this way, they reached out and grabbed you. And isn't that still true? When you read his parables, when you read the Beatitudes, when you see how he treated people, they just reach out and grab you there. Matthew 4, 23 is another passage that talks about the teaching. Je Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every infirmity among the people. Do you ever have a Bible concordance? It's, um, sometimes there's a concordance in the back of a Bible that's very limited. It just gives a few examples. But a real concordance is a huge book that has a list of every word in the Bible and where you can find it. So if you want to find law, you go to law, and there'll be a list of every verse in the Bible that has the word law in it. They leave out some words like a, and, the, and of, because those, I mean, really don't count for very much. But otherwise, all those words are there. If you go through and look up the word kingdom, you're going to find that a lot. When we think about Jesus teaching, Brian McLaurin reminds us that Jesus taught a lot about the kingdom. And if we're going to understand Jesus' teaching, we have to understand what the kingdom is. 
He talked about the kingdom, what it means to be in the kingdom. And the kingdom has so many layers of meaning. It can, we can, it can certainly refer to our future hope when, when the Lord is in charge, when all is made well, when all is blessed as it should be. But we also talk about the inbreaking of God's kingdom right now, that we are called to be aliens in this world. You remember that? The Bible says we are aliens. I was at a church where we spent about a month on that, and we made some green cards. We passed green cards out to everybody in the congregation and said, you need to carry this green card and remember that you're a citizen of somewhere else. Well, some people didn't quite like that, you know. They kind of looked down on people who had to carry a green card, but it was a reminder to us that our real citizenship, our real home is somewhere else. You remember the old gospel song, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. I love people that sing that who have a million dollar mansion, you know. Doesn't look like you're passing through, does it? No, it looks like you have kind of built up a mansion right here, you know. Um, well, sometimes we sing that song, we don't really mean it, because we've got a lot invested in this life, if we're honest. These songs and these scriptures help redirect our thinking and remind us that, hey, we're living for something other than what we can see here and now. And it gives us a hope that helps us during times of testing or crisis. I think about growing up as a little church kid, I don't think I was aware of how differently some people looked at the teachings of Jesus and what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. And it wasn't until years later that I realized that not every church emphasized the teachings of Jesus as much as the Methodist church I grew up in. Did you know that? There were there were churches that spent most of their time and energy, think about it this way, on the teachings of Paul about Jesus. And they didn't always pay attention to the teachings of Jesus. What do I mean by that? They, they, they kind of focus things down on that the main deal is to do a few things, to realize you're a sinner, to realize you can't help yourself, to realize that only Jesus can help you, and that your only hope in life is to ask Jesus into your heart. Well, we believe all those things. There's nothing wrong with any of those things. That we're all sinners? Yep. That there's nothing we can do to save ourselves? Yep. That we have to depend upon the power of God, upon Jesus, for any hope in our life? Yep. And that we need to invite Jesus into our lives and in our, into our heart? Absolutely. We agree with all those things. The problem is not what they said. The problem is that they stopped there. They kind of stopped there. And said, you know, well, if you, can, if you can check off all the lists there, you're kind of done. Okay, let's go get baptized. Okay, let's go on to somebody else because you're done. We're living in this miserable old world. Make the best of it, but at least you're going to heaven. And that's the way it sometimes sounds, the way we sometimes tell the story. You, you know, one of the biggest things that keeps us from doing that is the teaching of Jesus. When Jesus went up to the fishermen, they're out fishing in their boat. Did he say to them, hey, before you fish anymore, are you going to admit that you're a sinner and that you need God's help? And they said, yes. And he's had them sign the card. He said, okay, go back fishing. He didn't do that, did he? No, he said, drop what you're doing and follow me. Jesus came and redirected people's lives. He didn't just ask them to sign a card and be saved. He called them to follow him, to be disciples. Now, I'll be honest. Growing up, I think the old-fashioned Methodist church did a pretty good job of helping us take seriously the teaching of Jesus. Because I never got the idea in Sunday school or in my dad's sermons or at church camp. I never got the idea that all you had to do was sign the card and then you were kind of done. I always understood, I think, the way it was taught that, hey, this is a huge calling that Jesus gives to us, the calling that Jesus gave to the 12 
is comparable to the calling that he gives to us as well. There are times that we sometimes try to convince people to follow Jesus and we end up watering it down. And we say, will you agree with this so you don't go to hell? Well, okay, I'll agree with that. Boom, you're done. Let's go on to somebody else. You remember that time when Jesus had some people who came and said, you know, I want to I follow you, but I got to go take care of this first. And Jesus said, let that go. You need to follow me. He, he, he raised the bar. He didn't ever watered it down and try to make it easy. He demanded a lot of those who chose to follow him. Something's missing when we make things sound a little too, well, there's nothing wrong with a simple gospel, but there is something wrong with a simplistic gospel. I talked about the teaching of Paul because Paul writes a whole lot about Jesus, and it's his verses, the verses from Paul, Romans and Galatians, that really um, help us understand what it means to admit our sin and to admit our need for God and to receive him as a Lord and Savior. Think about that verse we talked about before the prayer, Philippians 2.15. That comes from Paul too. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Another translation says, as you deal with one another, you should think and act as Jesus did. I don't know about you, but that's a pretty tall order. It's one thing to read these stories about Jesus and say, wow, he was so loving. Wow, he cared for everybody. Wow, he loved his enemies. Wow, he was quick to forgive. It's one thing to read those stories and say, yay, Jesus, I'm so glad you forgive me. It's another thing to read those stories and say, oh my, Jesus, you want me to forgive others. You hear the difference? It's easy to lean on Jesus and say, I'm glad you love me. We need to tell the whole story. Let the same mind that was in Christ Jesus be in us. The things we set, see about Jesus that give us pause and cause us to be filled with awe should also be reminders of what the church of Jesus is called to be today. Remember that great commission. Go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If we stop right there, it sounds like our job is just to go sign people up, right? Get that water out, wash them down, and go on to somebody else. But the Great Commission didn't end there, did it? It said, teach them to observe all things. Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things. What does it mean to be a disciple? I was listening to a little devotional this week that said disciple really means learner. Learner. One that we learn from. And certainly it means to be a citizen of that kingdom. There was a passage in the chapter this week that struck me hard. Jesus demonstrated the revolutionary truth that God's kingdom wins not through shedding the blood of its enemies, but through gracious self-giving on behalf of its enemies. He taught that God's kingdom grows through apparent weakness rather than conquest. It expands through reconciliation rather than humiliation and intimidation. It triumphs through a willingness to suffer rather than a readiness to inflict suffering. Jesus shared God to be a different, Jesus showed God to be a different kind of king, and God's kingdom to be a different kind of kingdom. Did you ever have one of those red letter Bibles where the words of Jesus were in red? Most, almost all of that's found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There are actually a few quotes of Jesus in Acts and in the, one of the letters of Paul as well, too. But almost everything's in those four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you had a red-letter Bible, you could go home and read all the red letters, and you could still watch the first playoff football game by kickoff time this afternoon. It wouldn't take all that long. But don't do that. Don't do that. 
is I want you to chew on those red letters every day of your life. Because every time you pick it up, you're going to see something new about this man who came not only to cause us to admire him and to praise him, but to, to follow him and to have the same mind in him that was in us. Is that a tall order? You bet it is. There are days that I wish it was just sign a card and get a little wet on my head and be done. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be great? No, it wouldn't really, because it'd be kind of silly. How much better to find the power. Some of my friends talk about ask Jesus into your heart. You know, that says a little more than we think, doesn't it? It's not just Jesus' forgiveness. It's Jesus' power. It's Jesus' power to work in and through you, to work in and through us. Do you ever wonder what Jesus would do with Mount Pleasant community? Jesus were to walk around our community and see what's going on. Do you ever wonder about that? We don't need to wonder about that because he's got an army. He's got more than one person. We don't look like a very big army today, but it's more than one, isn't it? And it's not just us. It's neighbor churches as well. Jesus has an army ready to do his work right here. We don't have to say, what if Jesus were here? We have to say, because Jesus is here, what do I do now? Let's bow our heads as we pray. Our God, thank you so much for the great and grand call of your son, Jesus. It inspires us. It challenges us. It causes us to gulp as we think about the life-changing power of being a follower. Nothing easy about it, O oh God, but we pray for your help to be about that work. And Lord, may those red letters just continue to Make us red hot on fire for you. Help us to stay in your word. Every time we read about Jesus, let's not just admire, let's invite. Let's invite his power and his presence in us. May that same mind that was in him be in us. As we see the way he thought and acted and dealt with others, help us to think and act and deal with others in that way as well. Lord, we do lift up prayers for all those going through special needs right now. Let's take a moment of silence to lift up special concerns that are on our heart this day. Come, Lord Jesus, and bless us with your presence. And we pray now using the words you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Good night.